and just to be like Jesus. Hey, I forgot to tell you guys also, uh, and most of you probably already know that, is so uh, I am a grandpa one more time. And a healthy, healthy little baby girl. And, uh, and Irina is doing great, and Bree's doing great. And in another couple months, we'll be able to see the sa- uh, say the same thing again. We'll be able to say, well, we got another grandbaby again. This one, should, uh, this one will be a little boy. And, and be able to report more news to you about more kids coming into our family. Amen. But uh, we're so thrilled about that. We're so excited. And uh, loving the grandbabies. Man, I didn't know it could be that good. You know, the grandbabies are like really, really a lot of fun. And so we're enjoying those a lot. So we've been on a series now for a few weeks. And uh, how many of you want to be like Jesus? Uh, you only get two choices. There's no in-between. There's not like this secret, you know, uh, society to where there's somewhere in between. There's Jesus, the devil, and then somewhere in between. There's either Jesus. You know anything good in the world where it come from? When people do something, the Bible tells us it's the goodness of God that leads people to repent. Right? Anytime you see something good going on, you have to. You don't have to wonder. Was that? Did that originate from God, or did that originate from the devil? Anything that is destructive, anything that is uh, selfish, anything that is uh, causing uh, uh, chaos and tumult. You know, sometimes we try to attribute certain things to God to explain away why certain things are happening. Listen, if it's bad, it's not God, it's the devil. And if it's good, it's God. He's the originator of good. God is not only a great and an awesome God in the sense of ability, certainly he is that. But he's just a good God, and he tells us that. Jesus uh, even gave us the scriptures for that. I'm not going to turn there this morning, but he even gave us those scriptures when he said, look, if you know how to give good gifts to your kids, of which, I I mean, Debbie is always like, especially when it comes to the grandbabies. Man, I mean, she she, she just, she going out and buy, got to buy this, got to buy that, got to buy this outfit, got to get this, got to get, oh, they need this, oh, they look cute in this. I mean, it was all great. That's great, right? But she knows how to give good gifts to her grandkids. And the Lord said, if you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your kids, how much more will your Heavenly Father give good gifts to you? And so we have to realize that everything that's good is, is, uh, comes from God. And so we want to be more like Jesus. I want to be more like Jesus. I know that I'm not going to achieve to that to the maximum you know, the maximum, but I want to continue as my life goes on, I want to continue to be more like Jesus than I can. And so that's where we've been. Let me go ahead and jump in here on a couple of scriptures to kind of set the, the foundation for where I want to be this morning. In John chapter 8, verse 28, it said, Jesus said to them, When you've lifted up the Son of Man, then you'll know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father has taught me, I speak these things, and He that sent me is with me, He that sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I do always those things that please Him. So in other words, Jesus says, I just always do what what pleases the Father. You know, uh, 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 Paul was speaking in, in in the New Testament, and Paul said something like this. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. So when you're following Paul, you can be assured that you're following Jesus because Paul was emulating the life of Christ. And so Jesus is emulating the life of God, the Father. So Jesus says, I only do what I see the Father do. I only say what I hear the Father say. I only do those things that please Him. So Jesus is an example from God the Father on, on, in human form that he, he became flesh like you know what we are. Even though He's the Son of God, He became a man, right? And becoming a man, He still follows after the heart of God. In other words, everything Jesus did was ordained and was sanctioned by God. Whatever Jesus did, whatever Jesus said, there was no accidents, there wasn't a mistake. He didn't say, oh, let me, you know, backtrack. Everything he said was in perfect will and alignment with God the Father. So when we want to be more like Jesus, what in essence are you being more like? You're also being more like the Father. The heart of of the Father 
is represented in the heart of Jesus. And so that's the kind of people we want to be. First, First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. I want to start right here. He says, But I would that you... I, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others, hello, which have no hope. He says, I wouldn't want you to be like others who have no hope. Now, Jesus was talking about the people that were not looking to, to him. In other words, referencing, they don't have no hope. He says, I don't want you to be like that. He says, I want you to be people that have hope. And so everything that Jesus did as a man upon the earth, again, you have to realize he's the son of God, but he came as the son of man. He is the second Adam. Everything, and I, boy, I got, I got some good stuff for you, you know, two weeks from today. Two weeks from today, I got some things, and I can't, I can't get into that because I start getting into that, I'm going to ruin it for you. It'd be like getting dessert before you get to eat the meal. And, you know, you know as your parents, you don't usually let your kids do that. So I, I don't want to get into that just yet. But, I, uh, but everything Jesus did, everything he did, is something that we want to follow after. And he's always the presenter of hope. He wants each and every one of us to have hope when we're in the middle of a world that desperately needs hope. Do you know that there's people all around the world right now that just, they, they don't see answers. And, and you know, I, I, I thought back, I was thinking about this, that when I was, you know, a little boy and I was growing up, you have certain aspirations. I remember I used to, you know, I'm raised in Sandy Hook and, and uh, a little small town, you know, and lived out on a farm and I used to in our front yard I would my mom could tell you I would build like a little baseball diamond and I had the actual Cincinnati Reds uniform you understand I played for the Reds you know in my mind I played for the Reds I was like on the Reds team and I was a pitcher you know but then when I needed to I was also the cleanup batter I mean whatever I needed whatever the game needed that was me and I was I played for the Reds and then when I started in high school, got into junior high and, and high school, I also um, played for the Kentucky Wildcats. That's good. You know what I'm saying in my mind? I'm on, I'm like Kyle Macy. You know, I, I watched Kyle Macy when I was young growing up and, uh, and you know, I'm playing basketball. So in my mind, I kind of had, you know, figured out this is like, I'm going to be uh, Cincinnati Red, on the Cincinnati Reds. I'm going to be, play for the Kentucky Wildcats, you know. And then I didn't have a football team in, in uh, Elliott County. But in my mind, in my mind, I was the quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys. Yeah. I mean, I was like, I was like, you know, the quarterback. And then I got, well, maybe... Maybe the quarterback ain't good enough. And then I thought, I'm just going to move Jerry Jones out of the way. I'm just going to own the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> so I have this all pictured in my mind because what, what, what happens when you're in a young frame of mind? You have hope and aspirations for something. And then you get a little older and life kind of settles in and, and then you, you start dealing with things of life, Right? And you start you start getting hit with 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 you know bills. You start getting hit with with uh, disappointments. You start getting hit with with challenges, and things just don't always go the way that you think that they could go. And then all of a sudden, your hope begins to fade, and you begin to think, well, why am I here? What am I? What's this good for? And this is the way that many people end up end up uh, 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 you know committing suicide. They had aspirations in certain things that they thought that they were going to be able to do in life. And when they don't happen, then all of a sudden they're so disappointed and they get into a state of depression and they just begin to realize there's just no hope for the things that I wanted and the aspirations that I had. And they start sinking into a dark hole. And life begins to change and they don't see the world the same way that they did when they had hope and aspirations. And see, so you think that Jesus doesn't know that? What we have to realize is everything that you went through, everything you go through, you understand Jesus went through as well? I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I, I can. I'll say that much. You know Jesus went through everything you're going through? He, he had to. He's the second Adam. Okay? There was a first Adam who gave, up, gave his will. He had dominion and authority, and he gave up his dominion and authority. 
because he yielded to the temptation that the devil put in front of him and he allowed uh, sin to come into the world. Now, Jesus is referred to as the second Adam, so he has to be the one that comes in as a man because otherwise, if he's, got, if he's operating as God, then what he does is not the same as what, un, what caused sin to come into the world in order for that to be taken back had to be done through the same process as a man. Had to be a man. That's why Jesus came as a man and to, to defeat sin and overcome the temptation. So, I had those aspirations and hope, and then somewhere along the way, I realized I just wasn't going to make it for the Cincinnati Reds. Just landing, it just didn't happen, brother. I mean, it was just like went down. And then, and then I started playing basketball, and I thought, well, I can at least be, I can at least play for the Cats. And then something happened there, and I got through that process, and they never called me. They never recruited me. And I was like, well, shucks. So I thought, well, I didn't have a football team, so I couldn't shine on the football team as the quarterback. So I thought, well, maybe I could become a businessman and make enough money I can just buy the Dallas Cowboys. Yes. And that didn't work out either. So I've had to readjust some of my thinking. And then the Lord said, hey, I'll tell you what, why don't you just become a pastor? <laughs> and some people would say, well, that's a demo that would be a demotion. That actually, it would be, to be the owner of the Dallas Cowboys would be a demotion. Yeah. Now, as fun as that would be, and I would still might want to consider it, but um, it would be a demotion, right? Because I have the ability to affect some, affect some people's lives that's not just for a moment of time playing a, a sport, but right. eternal. Yeah. And see, the thing that we have to realize is this as well. We're going to have things that we're going to have to make adjustments on. And we have to recognize that we're always, there's always hope. Doesn't matter where you're at in life. Doesn't matter what you're dealing with. Listen to this in Romans chapter in Romans chapter 15, verse 4. And then I want to jump over to verse 13. He says, for whatsoever things were written before were written for our learning. See, that should tell us that the Bible was written so that you could learn. It isn't just a matter of one time or just to sit and just, you know, get, get inspired. All that's good. We want you inspired. We want you on fire. But he says, but it was written so that you would learn that through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, now in order for patience and comfort to come to you, you have to know the Scriptures, might, watch this now, through patient and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. He's saying essentially that, that uh, through the scriptures, from patient and comfort that come from the scriptures, produces hope in your life. So when the more you know of the word of God, the more hope is extended to you. And the problem is, is many people just don't know much about the Word of God. They, yes, they come into a service. Yes, they come into church occasionally, or maybe even they're often and frequent. But they're doing their, their religious duties. They're, they're fulfilling their religious responsibilities. And the reality of it is, is they're not really learning. And through learning the Scriptures, he says that it creates hope. Now watch, in verse 13, he says, Now the God of what? God, he's referencing that God is the God of hope. You know what the, the definition, the Bible definition of hope is? Because people get this mindset sometimes that hope means like, oh God, I just hope it all works out. See, that carries with it the connotation of doubt. It might, it might not. I hope it does. But the word hope actually is defined as confident expectation. The Bible definition of, of, of hope is confident expectation which usually results in pleasure isn't that amazing so he says now the God of confident expectation which usually use it, ends in pleasure fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may what abound you know what abound means like be plenteous. If I'm abounding in, in, in money, you know, that means if, if somebody said, I'm abounding in money, would you think that they have a shortage? No, you'd go, man, that guy's he's blessed. He's got the cash. He says that you may abound, have lots of hope 
through the power of the Holy Spirit. So the Lord is trying to show us that he wants us people that are filled with hope because everything Jesus did, he did with an anticipation of hope to create hope for humanity. And if we want to be just like Jesus, then we have to be people of hope as well. And you know, you cannot extend hope to someone else if you are not a recipient of hope yourself. You can't, how can you help somebody with hope if you don't have hope? If you're not a person that, that, that is hopeful, how can you help somebody to become hopeful? And so if we're supposed to abound in hope, then that's, he's giving us the indication here that he wants us to be just like Jesus. Jesus was all, the ultimate giver of hope. Now let me give you just a, a couple of examples of, of where this is uh, taking place. Look at John chapter 15. I'm sorry, John chapter 5. John chapter 5, I just want to give you a few of these just to kind of uh, settle it in your mind, the kind, of, the, the kind of life that Jesus was living. John chapter 5, verse 1, it says, After this was the feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and now there was at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches, and in these lay a multitude of impotent folk of blind halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. And uh, uh, whosoever uh, was the first one after the troubling of the water that stepped in was made whole of whatever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity 38 years. Now, folks, after 38 years of dealing with something and you showing up all the time and I don't understand why it was like that I don't have to understand everything I don't understand but apparently when the, an angel would come and cause the water to move and when the water moved the first one got in would be healed I don't understand that I don't know how that worked but obviously that was happening and this dude was showing up but after 38 years he just didn't have he just wasn't quick enough and he couldn't get in he's 38 years. Some of you ain't been alive 38 years. 38 years a long time to deal with something, right? After 38 years, you could begin to be without hope. You could think, well, it ain't happened yet, and I just don't, just, I can't see how it's going to happen. I just have no confident expectation that something that's pleasurable is going to happen, and that would mean getting, getting healed. I just don't have any hope. His hope, watch, his hope was not in God. His hope was in a man, which is a wrong place to put it. Watch. And a certain man was there and had an infirmity 38 years, and Jesus saw him lying there, and he knew that he had been there now for a long time. And he said to, them, said to him, Will you be made whole? Do you want to be made whole? Now watch what the man's response was. The impotent man said to him, Sir, I have no man that when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I'm coming, another one steps in before me. Dang that person. <laughs> I'm trying to get in, and somebody else gets in before me, and I just don't have anybody to help me. My hope is in somebody helping me. Jesus didn't ask him, would you like for a man to help you get in the water? He didn't ask that. He simply said, do you wish to be healed? Well, sir, I would like that, but, you know, there's no man because I'm looking at the man. And that's what happens many times today. People come into church services. They need a healing in their body, and they're looking to a man. They say, oh, this man is anointed, and, and he can be. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with, with being anointed, obviously. But people putting their faith in a man is the wrong place to put it. The man is just used of God, and if your faith is in the man, then you ain't going to get the results. When you get your faith in God being operated through the man, that's when it works. And so Jesus is right in front of the man, and he says, if there's no man to help me here, and Jesus asks him, do you want to be made whole? Now watch, 38 years, you think it'd be easy to lose your hope, but yet Jesus heals the man right there. I also was thinking about the story of in Mark chapter uh, 4 
when Jairus came to the Lord and he said, Lord, my little daughter lies at the point of death and if you'll come lay your hands on her, I just know that she'll be made whole. His only hope, at this point he's lost all hope, his only hope is in Jesus. Otherwise he would be somewhere else. She's at the point of death. If somebody's at the point of death, you find out where your hope's at. Right? He's at, she's at the point of death, so you find out where your hope is at based on what you do at that moment. And where's his hope? His hope's in Jesus. He finds Jesus. Why does, it's interesting to think, why does he have hope in Jesus? Because the scripture is actually working here when the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. It, it, it's actually working because Jairus has obviously heard about Jesus. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So he's hearing about Jesus. What do you think that J. Iris has been hearing about Jesus? People that come in contact with this guy is getting healed. People are getting healed. People are getting healed. People are getting healed. People are getting healed. And he's hearing that. Faith comes by hearing. So his faith is elevated that I can be healed. So he goes to Jesus and he says, if, if you'll come, my little daughter lies at the point of death. If you'll come, lay your hands on her. I know that she'll be made whole. And Jesus says, let's go, essentially, paraphrasing, let's go. He's on his way, and he gets interrupted by, look now, a lady that has had an infirmity for 12 years. 12 years of blood disease for 12 years, and the Bible says that she has spent all that she had, and not only did she not get better, but she's actually getting worse. 12 years, you spent all that you had, because now her faith has been in a man. But what happened? In order for her to be healed, what has, ha what, what has taken place? She heard about Jesus. So she heard about Jesus and she said, if I could just touch but his garment, I know that I'd be healed. See, otherwise she's lost all her hope, but then hope was restored because she heard about Jesus. Jairus Without hearing about Jesus, there was no hope. These people, their hope was restored because of what they heard and knew about Jesus. And then uh, look at John 9. You're in John 5. Look over at John 9. I love this story. Don't, I don't really go here very often, but I really do like this story. But I like it, and, it's full, and I don't have time to do, go through the whole chapter. Uh, because it talks about the events of what actually takes place in the first part of the chapter through the whole chapter. And, and we just don't have time to get into that. But this is what I want you to see. So there's a man that's been born blind. Now when you're born blind, even by today's standards, even by today's standards, you'd have to say is, is fairly hopeless, naturally speaking. So at this particular time, a man born blind, what do you think his hope is? There, there, is, there is no hope. You're born blind and this and you're blind and there's nothing anybody knows to do about it. Even if they want to do something about it, they can't do anything about it. They just don't know what to do. They don't have the, the ability to be able to fix something like that. But watch. Watch. Jesus shows up in verse 7 here. He says, well, verse 6, and when he had he'd spoken, he, he said in the verse before, he's the light of the world. He said that he spit on the ground, which seems a little unconventional, makes clay and uh, with the spittle, and anoints the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And he went on his way, and he washed, and he came seeing. Now this man, if it isn't for the fact of Jesus showing up, there is no hope for this man to see in his lifetime. But Jesus shows up and he says, wait just a minute, I can help you. I want to give you hope that there's a different life than what you're used to right now. I want to show you that your life can be better. I want to show you that there's things that you can do, things that you can experience that you would have never experienced before if it wasn't for me. And sometimes I think we look at the Bible like nice little stories that happened a long time ago, and it's really nice that it happened then, 
but it just couldn't happen for me today. I would submit to you that you are not a learned student. You are, you are hearing, but you are not listening because you're not learning. What do you say about the, comfort, the, the Scripture bringing comfort and peace and hope? The Scriptures bring hope to those who learn because they hear it, and they don't just hear it, but they receive it. And so he's saying to this man, I want to show you a life that you otherwise would not see. I want to give you a life of hope. What do you think happened when the man who had never seen, he's born blind, but all of a sudden he can see? He's, he's in a whole new world, right? Amen. Can you imagine that the moment that, that he can actually see, he's never even seen a person. He doesn't know what a person looks like. He doesn't know, I mean, he can pat a dog, but he doesn't really know what a dog looks like. He doesn't know what his mother looks like. He doesn't know what his father looks like. He has no concept of sight whatsoever, but all of a sudden he does. He gives the man hope for a better life. And that's what he wants to do with each and every one of us. And if Jesus wants to give people hope, and we act like we say that we want to be like Jesus, then what should we be doing? We want to give, or we should want to give people hope. But if you don't have any hope, you cannot be an extender of hope. You can't. How can you give somebody hope when you don't have no hope? When you wake up every day and you just go, I just don't know what in the world I'm even here. I'm just, you know, this is terrible. But I'll go to church. Glory to God. You can't be effective for someone else until you're living an effective life. When you live an effective life that the Lord is working through you, then you are positioned to help somebody else. And if we want to be like Jesus, and we should be, that's what he did. He gave people hope, and he gave this man hope. And after he washed in the pool of Siloam, immediately he begins to see. To the place that, watch now, even the Pharisees, they were like, they were freaked out over this, like, how in the world could this be? But then they're like, well, does he do this by uh, the prince of devils? Here's what I was trying to tell you earlier. Do you think the devil wants to heal somebody from being blind to where they can see? No, because that goes against everything that he represents. To, to, be, to be healed, to be able to see, means that's a good thing. He's not interested in doing a good thing. How could we ever think that somehow or another, that, but yet we do sometimes, not us, not you all, but the Christian world as a whole, that somehow or another that God and the devil trade positions occasionally just so that they can kind of, you know, keep up with each other. God is always good, always interested in doing good, and the devil's always interested in doing something that's bad. We have to recognize that God is, he's, he told us that he would never leave us, he'd never forsake us. No matter where we're at in life, He always wants to be in a position to help us to have more hope. He wants to give us something to where we can see that we there's a way out of the, the problems that we're in the middle of. And, and listen, if you're breathing, you got problems. I think sometimes we think, you know, we're going to hit this sweet spot to where, the, uh, you know, life, you hit a certain plateau and there'll never be a problem. Maybe uh, sometimes we equate that to money. You hit a certain level of money and I just won't ever have any problems. I don't care how much money you got. I'm in favor of you being blessed. I am. I, I mean, I, I want everybody to have more than enough because I believe that's what God wants for you. Have more than you need because then you can actually be a blessing when you have more than you need. Then you're positioned to give and help other people. So God wants you to have more than enough, but even having more than enough doesn't guarantee you no problems. You're still going to have problems. You're still going to have stuff happen, and you're still going to be challenged with wondering, you know, how do I get out of this? Uh, look at some of the people that through the years that, that are famous people that have committed suicide, had all kinds of money, fame, fortune, but they still, for whatever reason, weren't happy. They needed hope. And they were looking for hope in all the wrong places. Right? They weren't looking in the right place. They weren't looking at Jesus because if they were looking at Jesus, they would have found hope. And he would have begun to show them, wait just a minute, that's great that you got lots of money. It's great that you got lots of fame. But now let me show you how we can use that and you'll be fulfilled. You'll be satisfied. 
Amen. Amen. Now, is there hope? Uh, just speaking of money, is there hope? If you if you need money in your life right now, is there hope for you? Look at First Kings quickly. Is there hope for you to be blessed? Because something out. I know you say that because you know that's the response that I would expect for you to say, right? Oh, oh yes, Amen. Go, yes, sir. There's hope. But do you really believe that? No, you don't have to answer that. I'm talking about internally. Do you really believe that something could change? If you're in a, in a financial need right now, do you believe it could change? Because people think, well, they, they have to process it. Well, how would it change? You know, I mean, you have to go to work. I'm not real capable of doing a whole lot right now or this or that. And they process the whole thought out. How's this going to work? It don't, you don't have to know everything. I've given you the example. I don't know how my watch works internally. I mean, I know you got like a, you know, a battery in there and, you know, certain things. I have no idea how, how it tells time or on my iPhone. I have no idea how that, how that has the right time on it. I just don't know. That's right. And I don't care. <laughs> because all I care about at the end of the day is that I know it tells me the time. And when I know the time, it functions the way that it's supposed to. And some guy who has deals with little tiny screwdrivers and who's really, 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 really smart is in there internally doing stuff that I have no idea how it works. And he does, and that's all good because I get the benefit of it. I don't have to know everything about how everything works. I can still enjoy the benefits of it. Watch this. This lady, I guarantee you, that was what was going through her mind was, I have no hope. Look at this. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 8. The word of the Lord came, uh, came unto him, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belo uh, belongs to Zidon, and dwell there, because I've commanded a widow woman to sustain you. So he arose went to Zarephath. When he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow woman was there gathering sticks, and he called to her, and he said, Hey, uh, I pray that you'd get me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and he said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God lives, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I'm gathering two sticks I, that I may go in and dress it for me and my son that we may eat it and die. And does that sound like she's got much hope to live? She got much hope that her financial situation is going to change to be able to have enough to buy food or get food in some way? No, she's, she's hopeless at this moment. And she says, I can help you with some water. I, I can get you that. But all I've got is this, and it's for me and my son. Now watch this. What does... What does the man of God tell her here. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, because fear is obviously prevalent. You know, any time that there's fear, it also is robbing you of hope. See, when you have fear present in your life, that means that it's robbing you of your hope. And Elijah said unto her, Don't be afraid. Go and do as you said, but... This is, this is big news right here. This is big stuff, guys. Listen to me now. But make me a little cake first and bring it to me and after make for you and your son. Now, she could have responded and said, did you not hear what I said? Do you not understand? I said I barely have enough just for a little tiny bit for me and my son. What do you mean make for you first and then make for me and my son? We don't have it. She could have said that, couldn't she? And today, if that was going on today, and I've used this analogy before, um, if that was going on today, you realize that if that was on the news and somebody got wind of a preacher telling somebody, hey, I know you don't have much, but you go ahead and make it for me first. And then make for you, you understand, he'd be like, it'd be headline news. How dare a preacher for last meal? What they don't understand is this, it was a it was a formula, if you let me call it that. It's a formula to getting blessed. Yes, yes. It was a formula, a formula to create hope in her. Now, he set the tone in her mind. You make for me first, and then you'll have some for you too. What did that do? 
that created hope inside of her mind. It created, hey, maybe this can work. And what does she do? Look at this. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days, and the barrel of meal did not waste, neither did the cruise of oil fail according to the word of the Lord, which was spoke by Elijah. Elijah was simply the representative of God. He was the one that got the message to her to create hope inside of her that, hey, this is not the end. Do you know what most people would say today? They'd say, baby, I'm so sorry for you. I am so sorry that this is all you've got. I wish that it was better, but you know what? Just You know how the Lord is sometimes. Sometimes the Lord does, sometimes he don't. But you know, honey, we'll see you in heaven. Does that create hope? No. But what he said is, you, you follow after the word of the Lord here and everything's going to be all right for you. Today is not your day to die. Today is your day to live and today is your day to get a revelation that God loves you and wants hope for you. He wants you to have hope. What does he do? He turns her, her, her belief system in a direction to where that God can. Just by simply saying, wait just a minute, seek first. The Bible tells us, seek first the kingdom of heaven and all these things, things that you need, right? You go back in, in Matthew chapter 6 and you can read that. Seek first the kingdom of God. That's what she was telling him, or he was telling her. Seek first the kingdom of God. You do that with your, your sustenance, your finances, and what will happen. That's why the Bible tells us in different places, given it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. He tells us in Proverbs eleven twenty four, there are those that generously scatter abroad and yet increase more. They give. They give a lot away. But yet they increase more. Why? Because they have the understanding. They've read the scriptures. They've learned the scriptures. They know that whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. And when I'm sowing into the kingdom of God, and I'm not talking about, we ain't receiving no offering, so don't get tore up. Oh, he's just trying to get some. I, I, I honestly, I mean, I'm telling you, it is the last thing on my mind when it comes to, you know, like, do we have to, what do we got to do? Now, do I check and make sure, you know, because we don't write faith checks, do we, Linda? We're not going to write faith checks. We don't send. We don't go out there and say, "Glory to God, we're going to buy a playground." A playground system that costs forty thousand dollars, and we're going to send them a check. And we look, and Linda go, uh, "You know, we we got like eighteen thousand dollars, and it's forty thousand dollars. Just send it anyway. Glory to God, we believe God will just fill that account up somehow. Or another glory to God, twenty two thousand dollars going to just go into the deposit. Somehow, or another, it's just going to show up. And then when it don't, and they call you and say, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Fannin." Uh, we got a $40,000 check here and it bounced. You know, is that a good representation? No. no, so we don't write faith checks, but we do believe in faith finances coming in by faith. We believe that the things that we need and we believe that when people give, I believe this with my, all my heart, when people give, it'll also give, be given back to them. I believe that with all my heart. That's why I'd love to give. I love to be a part of the equation and the help. And, and then you, we have to hear from God to do the right things. That doesn't mean just be wild in our spending. We still have to hear the Lord say, do this, do that. But he wants us to have hope. You know, I, when we come up on here on the hill, let me just detour just for just a quick minute. We come up here on the hill. When we bought or was getting ready to buy this property, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I was driving down the road, and as I was driving down the road, I was just kind of complaining to the Lord. I'm sure you don't do that very often, or maybe you've never done it, but for me, I was doing it. I was like, Lord, we've been down that building now for all these, all this time downtown, a little small building, no place to even park. We don't even have our own parking lot. God, what are we going to do? We need a building. We need a place to go. We need a place to develop. We need things to be able to do. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? God, I'm looked, I've looked at this property. I've looked at that property. Nothing working out. What are we going to do? 
and I was driving. The Lord, there's something about driving and showers that the Lord speaks to me. It's like I'm in the shower sometimes. The Lord says, like, what? What did you say? Oh, okay. So I'm driving, and I am literally in between like uh, uh, the car wash down here now and Chick-fil-A right in this little span right here and the spirit of God spoke to me so loud that it was it felt like it was audible I, I don't know that it was but it felt audible and I heard the spirit of the Lord say look up that was it look up and I looked and I saw that ledge right here I, I guess I've driven by here hundreds of times through the years I knew there was an apartment complex up there but I'd never been up there I had no reason to go up there. I didn't need an apartment. Didn't know anybody had an apartment. Didn't have a reason to go. Never been there. Been there for years. And the Lord said, look up. And so I said, what, what is that? Is that property up there? So I went in the Chick-fil-A, uh, turned off to go there and turned around. And I turned back and I went up. And so I went up, the, up to the apartments and I looked over and I saw all that ledge of this property. And I was like, I wonder who owns that. Well, I thought, well, sh since we're at the apartments, the apartments are right there in this property down here, I'll just call and ask the apartment people. So I called and I go, ma'am, um, I was noticing there's some property below your apartments. Can you tell me who owns that? <coughs> and she said, yes, sir. She said, it's the gentleman that owns the apartment complex. His name is Fred Burns. And I said, do you know if Fred wants to sell that property? She said, I don't know, but I can give you his number in Florence, Kentucky. And I said, well, thank you very much. I would appreciate that. So I called, and I said, uh, some lady answered. I said, can I speak to Fred? Yes, can I ask what is concerning? I'm interested in his property in Ashland. Hold, please. He comes on the phone. Yeah. <laughs> He's kind of a gruff guy. You'd have to know him. I told him what, what happened. I said, I'm looking for a, a piece of property for our church. And I noticed that. I said, do you, is that something you'll say? Yeah, I want to sell it. How much do you want for it? $300,000. <laughs> Didn't sound that bad. Like, okay, that's not a, a crazy number. And I said, okay, can, can I look at a plat? Do you have a plat? Yep, I got it. I'll meet you down there next week. I said, oh, okay. So he comes and and we get in his, in his uh, uh, car, and he drives out here, and it is a mess. It is a I mean, there's a mound right over here in the parking lot where you're at over here. It was, there was a mound about as, it wasn't quite as tall as the building here, but it was probably three-quarters up, just a big mound of dirt. There's a big pond out here in the back that was where they used it as a retention pond for the, for the, the apartments when they were building. And I looked at that, and I'm like... How much will it cost to do all of that? Long story short, another $300,000. So nothing was easy, nothing was free, but here's what I want you to see. I begin to cry out to the Lord, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Lord, we need a place. We've got to have a place. We don't, well, he knows I'm sincere. And he says, I've got just the place that I can give you some hope. I've got just the place that'll give you the place to create hope, that you can do the same thing. Since you've got hope, you can be the giver of hope because that's what I do. That's the business that God is in. He's the giver of hope. Amen. And he says, I'll give you a place, and you do it. You'll have to be faithful with it. Now, at this time, we've got probably over $2 million in our property. I mean, it's the value of our property, over $2 million. And, and it all started with a little building downtown, a little tiny thing that, that as we were starting, I'll never forget when we was getting ready to, to start the church, the contractor that we've used on a lot of, a lot of jobs. I've known him for many years. And Ralph, Ralph come to me, and I told him what we wanted to do, build on the back of it. And I said, Ralph, it's a little tiny church building. And I said, well, we've got to have room for a nursery, and, and, and we've got to have room for a child, little children's church area. We've got to have something back there. And, and he said, well, I can build that for about $100,000. That was back 16 years ago. 
we were going to have almost $300,000 in it. And I'm looking at it, and I'm like, okay. I don't know how we'll do it. Because, I, I mean, y'all weren't here. You know what I'm saying? There wasn't nobody here. They was me and Debbie and the girls. I said, oh, oh, all right, we'll figure something out. We're going to figure something out. We're going to do it. And he looked at me, and he goes, because he's done a lot of stuff for me through the years. He looked at me, and he said, are you sure about this? I'm like, not really. <laughs> but we're going to do it anyway. Because <laughs> the Lord had instilled some hope in me that we could do something. Let me, let me try to get to a place where I can close. In, in Romans 4, I want to turn to two more scriptures. Romans 4, and then I'm going to turn over number thir- Numbers 13, and we'll try to get a place to disconnect here. In Romans chapter 4, Verse 17, the Lord gives us the epitome, the picture of what hope really looks like. You remember the story of Abraham, right? Abraham was told back in the Old Testament (coughs) in uh, Genesis, the Lord spoke to him and said, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. He said, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. Your name's going to be changed from Abram to Abraham. And Abraham's like, well, how to, how's that going to happen? Because I ain't got no babies. And he told him, then he goes on to tell me, he says, it's going to be your seed in Sarah, and she's going to give uh, uh, birth to a son, and through that son, you're going to of many nations. And he even told him, he said, give, give him a, a visual picture. He said, look up into the, into the sky and look at the stars. Can you count the stars? <coughs> you ever been out and looked on a starry night? It's impossible to count the stars, right? He says, or go to the sand. And can you count the grains of the sand? Y'all ever try to count even just like a couple of, I mean, you, you, you get tired real quick. Right? He says, this is how many that your generations are going to be. This is what's going to happen. Now Watch. In verse 17, he said, As I've written, I've made you the father of many nations. He was appointed our father, and this is the Amplified Bible. This, he was appointed our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and speaks of the non existent things that he has foretold and promised as if they already existed. For Abraham, human reasoning for hope being gone, hoped in that faith that he should become the father of many nations as he had promised. So numberless shall your descendants be. Uh, He did not weaken in faith when he considered the utter impotence of his own body, which was as good as dead because he was about 100 years old. And when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's deadened womb, no belief uh, uh, or unbelief or distrust made him waver, doubtingly question concerning the promise of God but he grew strong and was empowered by faith and he gave praise and glory to God fully satisfied and assured that God was able and mighty to keep his word and to do what he had promised that is why his faith was credited to him as righteousness in other words even when in the in the in the King James version it says against hope he believed in hope in other words, he is simply saying he had absolutely no reason to have any hope. But God said, don't look at the circumstances. Don't just be convinced with what you see. Just know that things can change in a moment's notice. Your financial condition could change in a moment's notice. Your health condition could change in an, in an instant. Your children that maybe aren't serving God could change in an instant. Just know that God wants to create hope within you that it isn't over. It's not over. And you it's only listen, it's only there's only no hope when you stop believing. There's only no hope when you stop believing. When you stop believing that God is able, capable, willing, you know, that was like when a leper came down one time before the Lord, and he said, Lord, I know you can, if you will. He knew God had the ability. He just was not sure about, was he willing? 
And Jesus said, I will. Well, if he will for him, the Bible says that God is no respecter of persons. If he will for him, why won't he for you? Because you can't ever get in the mind of where you think somehow or another, well, he does for this one, but I'm just not sure for me. If you, if you go down that road, how in the world could you ever think that it would be for you? My mind is always this. If you did it for him, when I find an example and I learn the scriptures, if you did it for him, you'll have to do it for me. Not out of arrogance, but because your will is your word. Your word is your will. And you are a man that you shouldn't lie or that you wouldn't lie. That's what the Bible says. God is not a man that he should lie. And so if God's word is true, then I can look at it and say, well, wait just a minute. If you did it for him, then I know you'll do it for me. And if you'll do it for me, then why in the world am I going to stop believing? Why am I going to disconnect my faith? It doesn't matter what you're going through. If, you got, if you're in a place of depression, there's hope for depression to come out of depression. If you're, you have anxieties, do you know the Lord is a master at changing anxieties into cheer and joy? If you're not happy in your life right now, do you know that there's hope for your happiness? God can change all of this. You just have to be willing to be a participant in it. Because that's, remember what, what the song that we sang earlier. Um, uh, you know, I'm available. Well, God uses the ones and, and helps the ones that make themselves available. You make yourself available to the blessing of God, you'll receive the blessing. You know, even your desires. He said in, in Psalms 37, verse 4, delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll what? He'll give you the desires of your heart. I mean, even that, even there's, there's hope even for desires. Now look at Numbers 13, and we'll close right here. Started thinking about Hope is either, hope can either be contagious to create more hope, but if you go the opposite direction and you're the robber of hope, it can also be contagious. It's why I'm very careful about who I hang my hat on with the people that I surround in my life. I've said it before, I'm going to say it one more time. I love everybody. I want everybody to come to the knowledge of, of the saving grace of the Lord Jesus. I do, I, I genuinely do. I, want, I hope everybody will, will, would come to that, and I'd love to try to help, be a part, part of helping lead somebody, anybody, as many as possible to the Lord Jesus. But that does not mean you get to be in my inner circle. Because you can be saved and just and, and have faith for salvation and not faith for healing, and I don't need you around me if you don't have faith for healing and I'm sick. I remember Mark Hankins, Mark and Trina Hankins, uh, they were at our church a number of years ago, and Brother Mark was talking about and telling the story about where Sister Trina had had, had, had a brain tumor. And uh, her life is on the line. She's in the hospital, and the doctor's getting ready to do some things, and they're believing, they're, they're, they're believing God to work in this situation for this tumor to be removed and, and for her life to, you know, to, to be sustained through this. And he said he made a list of people that were allowed to come in the room, and he pastored a big church. Now, when you're a, 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 mem a member of a big church and you love your pastor, right? It was a great opportunity for you. Say, amen, yes, yes, we love our pastor, right? They love their pastor. So, Pastor, pastor, um, pastor Mark, you'd say, well, anybody that wants to stop by and say hello and just encourage her could do it. The problem is this. How do you know who will be the encourager and how do you, be the, how do you know the one that will be the doubt sower? So somebody comes in and they look at you and, and, and you're in a, in a, in a weak, weakened looking state or maybe in a weakened physical state and you're trying to believe your way. You've got everything in you wanting to believe God and trying to believe God. And listen, it's hard when you're, when you're beat up. That's when you need the people around you to, to build you up. And somebody comes in and says, I'm so sorry. Oh my gosh. Oh, but you know, 
Sister Trina, I know we're all going to meet up in heaven. That is not what she needs to hear. What she needs to hear is, you know what? Jesus went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Jesus went about every place he went he said when the leper came down he said Lord I know you can if you will and Jesus said I will he said he took your infirmities and he bore your sicknesses Matthew 8 17 uh, or 1 Peter 2 24 says it was by his stripes that you were healed that's what you need to hear you need to hear you need to know that somebody comes in they're going to elevate your faith not deflate your faith and you just don't know that unless you have a relationship with somebody and there's lots of people we know that we know, but we don't really have necessarily have a relationship with them. So somebody comes in and deflates my faith, I can't have that. Because hope is either contagious, but deflating hope can be contagious too. Watch this. So God spoke to Moses in Numbers 13, and he tells him, he says, you send 12 spies out into the land, and you go, you go see and bring back a report. Now they go out into the land and they come back and they say, oh, the land is a land that was filled with milk and honey. It flows with milk and honey. It is truly a great land. But there are giants in the land. That was okay. Because he said, come back and tell us what you find. He didn't say, come back and tell us whether you think we can do it or not. He just simply said, tell us what you find. It is a land that's full of and flows with milk and honey. It is a land that has giants in the land. It is a land that has, a, a, you know, strong, the, the walls in the cities are walled and they're strong. That was all fine until they said, but we'd be not able to go against them. Now Moses didn't ask him and God didn't ask him, give me their opinion whether we think that we can do this or not. Because after all, I need their opinion. God wanted them prepared knowing what was at stake, what had to take place, what was in the land, but he didn't want their opinion. And let me just say, he doesn't want your opinion. Oh, now you're making me mad. How dare you say God don't want my opinion? Well, he's not interested, and we shouldn't be interested in other people's opinions. We should only be interested in what does the Bible have to say, especially if I'm in a place where I need hope built up. If I'm a giver of hope, then I have to be making sure that what I'm about ready to say is based upon the Word of God, not my opinion. Well, I think, you know, you just never know. You know, I know the Bible's kind of hard to understand, and so uh, this is what I think. I think that God heals some and heal, others He don't heal, but you know, maybe you'll be the lucky one. Get that person out of my face because they're not helping me. They're not encouraging me. They are not building me up. Give me what the Bible says. So watch. So they come back and they go, we're not able to go against the land. We're not able to go against them. They're too strong. They're too big. They're, they're too tall. It's too much. Watch what happened. When they said all of this, verse 30, and Caleb stilled the people before Moses, and they said, let us go up... Or, or Caleb stealed the people but he said let us go up at one and possess it for we're well able but the men that went up with them said we're not able to go against the people for they are stronger than we and they brought up watch an evil report of the land in other words their evil report was a report of doubt fear and no hope there's no way we can do this. And in fact, Caleb was saying, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Of course we can do it if God be with us. And that should be our attitude when we talk to other people. Of course, of course we can do it if God is with us. Of course we can do it when we have the word of God. The thing is, is you just can't randomly just go out and make up a bunch of stuff and say, well, I think this is God. That's why he talks about being comforted by the learning of the Scriptures because the more that you learn about the Scriptures, the more that your faith will grow because the Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So the more that you hear about this, I'm telling you, our goal, when the Lord spoke to me years ago about starting a church, he told me that primarily that my ministry was a ministry of building up the saints. 
primarily. Now, we we're always have the attitude of we always want to see people born again. Of course, that goes without saying. We're always, our heart is, is, is ev- ev- evangelistic in the sense that we're always interested in that, and that's always a part of it. But the primary gift that the Lord told me that I would have in pastoring a church would be to build up the people, would be to strengthen and encourage the people and, and help them uh, along their way as they grow with the Lord. And folks, that's what we have to, that, it, that's what my endeavor is. And that's what our endeavor as a part of the body of Christ should be if we want to be like Jesus. That we're going to build up people. We're going to encourage people. We're not going to tear people down, but we're going to build people up. And, you know, Joel, I know Joel Osteen takes a lot, of, a lot of, you know, criticism. But it's like, man, the guy, every time I ever flip across the station, every, if he's ever preaching, I'm listening to him. And I'm like, so this is, this is the best you got to tear this guy down is that he's going to encourage you to death? It's like, look, folks, we need to be encouraged. We, we need the encouragement. We need someone telling us it's going to be all right. God is with you. He wants to help you. Your financial situation is going to be all right. Your health condition is going to be all right if you'll just make yourself available. Amen. Make yourself available. Ask the Lord. You know, Somebody might say, well, how in the world... How would, would my financial situation came, come when I'm a, a, a person of limited means? Well, you know, because we always have the mindset something's going to happen. It's just going to come checks in the mail or something like that. Well, what about if God gave you creative ideas? What if God gave you a creative idea that said, hey, do this, do that. Are you available for that? Are, are you open to that? What if the Lord said what he said to Naaman? What if he said, I want you to go out and dip seven times in the River Jordan and your flesh will come clean to you? What if he said, run around the church? Now, sometimes us Pentecostals get a, 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 a knock for, you know, like, ooh, too much, too much. Because it's all emotionalism. That's the thought sometimes. But what? But, but wait just a minute now. But what if the Lord said, Respond. What if he said, I mean, I think Naaman would have been probably, he would have probably been considered a a, a, uh, fanatical. He's out there, look at old Naaman. He's out there dipping seven times the River Jordan. I mean, what's that all about? It's because we don't know everything. And I believe that, and I'm just giving you, this is one of my beliefs. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to categorize that. You, You can ask the Lord, but this is what I believe the Lord showed me about Naaman. Naaman had an issue with pride. He didn't want to dip in the river Jordan. He said, are there not better rivers than this that I could do? Why would I have to do that? And he had to deal with pride in order for the Lord to heal him. There wasn't anything about the water. There wasn't anything magical about the dip. Because he had to submit himself and say, I'm, I humble myself before you, Lord. You said to do this, then I will do it. If the Lord said, take off running, then you take off running, and I'll heal your body. The Lord does all kinds of things that are not, you know, in a, in a manual. Like, if you do this, I'll do that. Because you're an individual, and God speaks to each and every one of us a little bit differently. And when he speaks to us, he's told me, he doesn't tell everybody, look up. Right? But he tells you things. And here's the bottom line. Whatever he does, whatever he says to you, to me, to everybody, it's always with the underlying goal of this. I want to create hope in you. I want to encourage you. Because I want you to be positioned so that you can give hope to someone else and you can encourage someone else. Because... If I'm following after Paul, and Paul is following after Christ, and Christ is following after the Father, and then you're following after me, if I was following after Paul, and Paul was following after Jesus, and Jesus was following after God the Father, then who are you really like? You're not like Phil. You're going to be like God. If you would bow your heads just for a moment, please.
Heavenly Father, we're so grateful today to be in your presence, to be able to hear from you, Lord, that you would give us insight into your word, that you want us to be people that have hope. It doesn't matter what we're going through in this life. It doesn't matter the challenges or the difficulties. We know there'll always be difficulties. But you're the one that can help us through. You help us to navigate through every situation, every problem, every difficulty. The Holy Spirit is available to us to help us to navigate through life and to extend the hope of God inside of us so that we can be the extenders of hope for other people that are around us as well. That we can give from what we've received. And so, Father, I pray that this message today has been a blessing, that it's been a help for people that have heard it to know that you always are trying to get whatever they need in life. You're trying to help them because you want them to have hope. Not only do you want us to have hope in our eternal life, that, that's a given. We know that. And our hope lies in Jesus for that. But our hope in healing also lies in Jesus. Our hope in our financial lives lie in Jesus. Our hope for a better life always lie within Jesus' life. And so I pray, Father, that the Word of God has been revelational this morning and helpful to every person that has heard it. And I praise you and thank you for the Spirit of God giving me utterance and guidance for everything that's been said that, was you, that you wanted said. It's because of you, Lord. And I praise you for that. With every head bowed, every eye still closed for one moment. If you're here this morning and you don't know the Lord Jesus, then he says, I came to give you hope that there is a better life. There's a life that you can enjoy, a life of salvation, to know that when this life is over, and it will be, nobody lives forever physically. When this life is over, there is hope for eternity in the presence of God. And you can't even imagine that. Even your best imagination falls short of what that'll be like, how wonderful that'll be. And if you don't have that hope in Christ, then it is a very simple thing to change that. He said that if you'll believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. He said, if you'll just believe, and if you'll confess that God raised Jesus from the dead, you'll be saved. That's what it takes, folks. He's not asking for you to reach perfection. He's not asking you to make sure that everything's perfect in your life. It's never going to be perfect in your life. But what he is asking is this, is make yourself available to me. If you make yourself available to me, I will make myself available to you. If that's you this morning and you don't know the Lord, or maybe at one time you have and you've allowed yourself to get separated from Him, would you raise your hand and say, Pastor Phil, that's me. I'm not where I need to be with God. I'm not in, the, I'm not, I'm not in a current relationship with Him, but I want to change that. It is so easy 